Hello. Okay, uh, thank you, Ravin. I hope you can hear me uh, and everything looks okay. So yes, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to wish you a happy birthday, Ravin, and uh, many more successful years of uh, all the different types of work you've done. Uh, I want to begin by actually recalling uh, a very famous work by you uh, in this paper with Patrick Lee uh, of uh, spins. Uh, this was modeling semiconductors in random positions with an exchange that decays exponentially between them. Uh, and by an RG analysis uh, of this type of model, uh, what you found, what uh, Robin found was the, a strong disorder fixed point where the spins uh, freeze into singlets uh, in a hierarchical manner. And this is now what's called the random singlet phase. So it was my good fortune when I became a postdoc at Bell Labs to, to learn about this work and uh, extend it uh, in some directions. Uh, and I learned a lot about the very interesting interplay between disorder and interactions uh, while we were doing this. Also, you will notice this is in 1986, uh, just before the cuprates were discovered. So this is very fortunate because uh, uh, this kind of knowledge of spin systems was just what was needed uh, to, to work on the cube rates. So of course, once that happened, I jumped on, on the studying the cube rates. Um, and so this model uh, here is actually not so far from uh, the model in, in the SY paper of the SYK model uh, in 1993. Uh, it's the same spin dot spin interactions, but now the JIJ are just independent random numbers. So the, now the spins are in some uh, cluster and every spin is coupled to every other spin. And what we found in this uh, paper was a very different type of ground state from the, the one that Robin had found. Uh, and one fundamental difference is that the disorder self averages. So here, uh, in fact, uh, you know, you don't float a strong disorder fixed point. Effectively, you flow to a zero disorder fixed point where the disorder doesn't matter at all. Uh, and it's, you get some rather incoherent uh, type of state at non-zero temperature and a gapless quantum spin liquid at zero temperature. So in this case, if you look at the spin autocorrelation function, uh, decays as one over time. Uh, and uh, this is the same on every side. So this constant C is independent of I, even in a given sample. And that's very, very different from uh, the random singlet phase uh, that uh, uh, Robin had studied. So, so this is, of course, a rather artificial model with spins coupled in uh, all to all. Uh, but we were pretty excited by this result. Uh, because the Fourier transform of this uh, is what's now called the marginal spectrum. Uh, and stated here, one might hope that the mathematical structure of the mean field theory is of broader significance. Uh, and that's exactly the hope that uh, uh, we think uh, we started to realize today after many years of work uh, to put the physics of uh, this kind of uh, gapless quantum spin liquid into a realistic model and hopefully describe the strange metal. Uh, and so you will notice the, you know, the physics here is very, very different from localization, where you effectively flow to an infinite disorder fixed point. Uh, here, because of strong interactions uh, and strong entanglement, uh, the disorder just self averages and, uh, and you get in some ways a much simpler theory, uh, which you can uh, make uh, progress with. Okay, so the actual theory that uh, will be the, you know, it's taken many years of work from uh, uh, from 1993, many uh, stops and starts to try to make that physics more realistic. And I think the greatest progress has come in very rapidly in recent years uh, by this model, which uh, people are calling the Yukawa SYK model, where you have some fermion in this case taken dispersionless. Um, and bosons with the same frequency, so some oscillators, and they're coupled in this Yukawa manner with a Yukawa coupling GIJL. Uh, and in this case, you take this coupling GIJL uh, to be independent random numbers with zero mean uh, and some mean square value G squared, 
Uh, and then in the larger limit, this model is, uh, is exactly solvable. And in fact, today, not just the larger limit, but uh, a lot of the finite end physics is very well understood. Uh, but from a formal point of view, this model is really uh, one appealing feature of it is that the migdal Leisberg equations, which appear in many different contexts in physics, uh, but usually as a somewhat ad hoc approximation, uh, here, no matter the value of the coupling constant G, uh, these migdal Leisberg equations are, are in fact the exact larger end equation. So this is how you make the migdal Leisberg process exact by having couplings that are uh, random. Uh, and this has appeared in many, uh, many papers in, the, in recent years, uh, and uh, especially this paper of Alde et al., which will uh, lead to the things that I'm not going to discuss. So in this particular model as written was uh, solved by Ilya Estudis and York Schmalian. Uh, so here are the migdal Leisberg equations for the self-energy of the fermion and the boson. Uh, and when you solve them, uh, you get a power law decay, uh, very much like the SY model with some exponent. In this case, the exponent is determined by solving a transcendental equation. Um, and the structure of this power law decay implies that there's some emergent conformal invariance and is well understood uh, what happens at finite n, where the conformal invariance is weakly broken. Uh, and uh, all of that is dual to the physics of two-dimensional black holes. So that's a huge subject that I that I won't go into. Our objective here is to is to model some real physics uh, on Earth in uh, uh, in a realistic model, not an artificial zero-dimensional model like this one. But we're going to learn a lot by by what happens in this model. Okay, so. The work I'm going to now describe is done in collaboration with uh, three brilliant young people that I've been fortunate to work with. Uh, Avish Karpatel, uh, now at the Flatiron Institute. How you go is a student at Harvard. And Ilya Estelis, who will soon be a faculty at the University of Wisconsin. All right. So let me just begin by defining a few terms and highlighting the experiments I'm interested in. So we all know the strange metal, most famously uh, in the cuprates above the superconducting phase, but it's found in numerous other materials, uh, including uh, twisted bilayer graphene most recently, uh, uh, the nictides and, and many heavy fermion compounds. So despite its widespread uh, identification, there's a remarkable universality in the properties of a strange metal as measured in transport as emphasized in this paper by Sean and uh, Sean Hartnell and Andy McKinsey recently. First of all, famously, the resistance is linear in temperature at very low temperatures, and the resistivity is smaller than the mott yoffe regal value. If it was bigger, we'd call that a bad metal, which is not what I'm talking about. The specific heat goes as T log T, uh, and the optical conductivity has a real part that decays as one over omega, or one over temperature, whichever is largest, uh, given by the scaling function. And this effective mass here, which is not the effective mass of the quasi-particles, but something you would measure in the conductivity, uh, is uh, has a log divergence. And all of this you know, fits a wide variety of data, this very universal structure. Uh, and I'm going to present a theory which actually reproduces all of these features. Uh, so, how do we begin a theory? So one simple example is imagine we're near some quantum critical point. And the simplest quantum critical point would be, say, a, a pneumatic criticality where you go from a, a, a tetragonal symmetry to orthorhombic symmetry uh, with an Ising order parameter, which we we'll call phi. Uh, then there's a quantum critical region. And you can now ask, perhaps, this region where you're influenced by this quantum critical point is some sort of a strange metal. Uh, okay, so now this particular critical point has been studied in some detail over the last two decades. So you take a Fermi surface of a fermion psi coupled to some critical bosonic order parameter uh, with a Yukawa coupling G. Okay, uh, and I think the earliest person to notice that this leads to, or a model like this leads to a uh, breakdown of quasi-particles is Patrick Lee. Uh, where he showed that the self-energy had this 
uh, very small power omega, omega to the two thirds, uh, and this uh, led to a very short uh, particle lifetime, in fact, shorter than its energy. So the idea of a quasi particle broke down. Uh, the boson propagator D uh, has this Landau damping form, uh, which is crucial to this two third exponent. Okay, so that's exciting. I mean, maybe this, this could explain some of the experiments. Uh, but as has become clear over the years, uh, when you start looking at transport, this particular theory uh, is not strange at all. In, in fact, it's a perfect metal uh, because of conservation of momentum and strong fermion boson drag, which was overlooked in many of the uh, earlier and not so early papers. And the conductivity is actually just pure drudelite in this continuum theory. You have to put umclap or disorder to get anything different from a pure delta function. So, so the answer is that this thing is a non-Fermi liquid as far as the excitations of the Fermi surface are concerned, uh, but not a strange metal because the transport looks nothing like uh, what's seen in the experiments. Uh, so this gives me an opportunity to make some definitions. So I just give you an example of a non-Fermi liquid where the one electron scattering time, tau, this should be distinguished from the time in the transport. Uh, one over tau is much bigger than epsilon, whereas in a Fermi liquid, it's much smaller than epsilon. And there's a marginal case, which will play an important role in, in the sub remaining discussion, uh, where one over tau is of order epsilon. Uh, where the quasi particles are marginal. Okay, so this is defined by single particle property. This is when I say a non Fermi liquid, this is what I mean. When I say a strange metal, well, I mean something that has linear resistivity and all the other properties are defined. And those are not equivalent definitions, as we'll see. Okay, so what I've shown you is that if I take a Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson with no disorder at all, uh, it's a non-Fermi liquid, but not a strange metal. All right, so we have to add some disorder. That's really the direction that's necessary. And this is, you know, this has been known for a while, and many people have tried, and including me and uh, Avishkar and others. Uh, and after many years of trying, I think we are now closing in on the, the best way to do it and how to get something that uh, actually is most realistic and also tractable. Uh, so we're going to, it'll turn out we have to add two types of disorder. There's a potential disorder, which is the usual disorder uh, that's in the theory of uh, localization or uh, disordered Fermi liquids as V. But here we also have to consider disorder in the Yukawa coupling, uh, which I'll call G prime. So first let's add potential disorder. So if I take this theory, of a non-Fermi liquid, uh, the first two lines, and add some random potential disorder. Um, and uh, so V of R is spatially random and has a, a mean square value uh, uh, V. So this was also uh, presented in a talk in the first day of the conference. Uh, and what you find now is that this, the Landau damping form of the boson self-energy is mod omega, not mod omega over Q. So this has a dynamic exponent z equals two. And if you are following the same methods as in Patrick Lee's paper, if you compute the electrons fermion self-energy, you get the usual Drew scattering rate proportional to v squared, and you get this marginal Fermi liquid correction, uh, omega log omega, which implies that the electron scattering rate is of order energy. So this is exciting. You've got a marginal Fermi liquid self-energy and therefore a T log T specific heat. Uh, and so maybe we are onto something. Uh, so this result has actually been known for a while, in, including in the Halpern Lee Reed paper uh, in a slightly different context. But if you now compute the transport, uh, you find uh, something very different. So there's this G squared log term here, omega log omega in the marginal self-energy. Uh, so you would like that to appear in the transport scattering time because that will give you a linear and temperature resistivity. Uh, but you find that does not happen. There's an exact cancellation, again, due to momentum conservation. If there's time, I'll say a little bit more about that in the end of my talk. Uh, but it's, it's nothing has to, this doesn't have anything to do with the one minus cos theta factor that you're familiar with between 
tau and tau transport. This is really the physics of drag. Um, and the inelastic processes conserve total momentum and therefore don't lead to any transport resistivity. So the resistivity is just like a Fermi liquid with the, with the residual resistivity uh, proportional to the inverse of the scattering potential. That's just the usual uh, solid state physics 101 answer. So, so therefore, I can add one more entry into this thing. If you take a Fermi surface coupled to critical boson and we add potential disorder V, which is what we always do in the entire theory of localization, uh, here it leads to a marginal Fermi liquid, uh, but it's not a strange metal. So it's important not to uh, in, assume that the two are equivalent to each other. Okay, so finally, uh, our main result has to do with spatially random interaction. So why would you want to add spatially random interaction? Well, first of all, there's a huge amount of experimental evidence that interactions are very random. Here's one paper where you see that the gap, even at optimal doping, uh, has a, a spread in value, which is of you know, order the mean. So uh, on, on, uh, on a nanoscale. So there's definitely some interaction that's varying rapidly from point to point. Uh, and it's easy to understand why, uh, if you have some randomness in hopping Tij, that will lead to random interaction, exchange interaction, J squared over U. So suppose this type of interaction is just driving some instability. So you have some J, which is a, a function of R, and there's various, uh, there's the center of mass coordinate and various form factors have been omitted. So I can decouple this interaction by Hubbard's Ranovich transformation to phi squared over 2j of r minus phi psi dagger psi. And in this form, it looks like a mass term for phi, uh, which is spatially varying. So if you, you know, pull out your RG hat and just look at the scaling dimension of this mass term, you find it strongly relevant. And, you know, this has been known for a while. And so you say, well, as in the usual localization theory, something's flowing to infinity. I don't know what to do. Uh, maybe you're going to flow to a strong disorder fixed point. Uh, but the hypothesis is, in fact, you don't. Uh, and one way to treat this mass is actually use the fact that there is no bare term in phi and just rescale phi. So if I rescale phi, I can transfer the randomness in the mass to the randomness in the coupling. And once you do this, uh, then it turns out to be very tractable. Uh, and in fact, you get a random Yukawa coupling, much like in the Yukawa SYK model. Uh, and, and that we can now treat. So therefore, the model we want to consider now, in addition to the potential disorder I described, has a G, which is the uh, usual Yukawa coupling that everyone uses, but uh, add another term G prime, uh, which is, has zero mean and mean square value g prime square. Now you go ahead and turn the crank, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about the crank uh, at the very end of my talk, uh, and what happens. Well, first of all, when you look at the self-energy, it's nothing new really in the end, because the uh, the bosons uh, Landau damping, in addition to having a g squared term, has a g prime squared term, mod omega, and so it's the usual uh, diffusive boson. And the self-energy therefore also has an omega log omega contribution, one from the random V and the other from the random G prime. So far, it hasn't given anything new. But when you compute the transport, uh, you get, the, this is the key result of our analysis. This marginal Fermi liquid self-energy does not give you linear T resistivity. Uh, but this does. Uh, now the momentum is not conserved uh, in the Yukawa interaction, and that's exactly what you need to now get exactly the linear T resistivity. Uh, so that's really our main result. Uh, you can then compute many other things. For example, the full frequency dependence of the optical conductivity uh, had exactly the form that uh, I showed uh, experiments indicate where the tau transpose had two contributions. There's the Drude term, as usual, V squared, and then there's the linear and frequency or linear and temperature term proportional to G prime squared. 
and this the, and then the Trump Hilbert transform of the mod omega gives you a log omega term in the effective mass in the optical conductivity. So that's our main result. The residual resistivity is determined by the potential disorder. The linear resistivity is determined by the interaction disorder. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, and thermodynamics and the optical conductivity this all all fits. And we are now, you know, thinking about many other observables, and we are pretty confident that this will uh, describe them too. So you know, and and one nice thing about this I, explanation is, it, you know, the theory is so simple. You can just see it's, it's very generic. It applies to almost any order parameter or a gauge field or emergent particle. All you need is a Fermi surface, a critical, a collective mode that's low energy, and some disorder in the coupling. And then you get, you know, what's the phenomenology is also correspondingly universal. You see it in many, many different systems. Uh, and uh, this is our claim theory of it. Uh, so if we have interaction disorder G prime, you get what you want, a marginal Fermi liquid and a strange metal. So I believe I have five more minutes. Uh, so I just want to give you a few more technical make technical remarks. I think I've hopefully explained the main result. Uh, so so the the whole analysis in the end is a formal analysis, but it's you know that's just a way to uh, make sure you're not making any mistakes in emitting graphs. So there's a large end method that you know it becomes foolproof when you have a large end to control everything. Uh, but the physics, hopefully, I've described. So, so here is the theory. Uh, what you do is you give everything some index, uh, the fermions and the boson that has n values, and then all the couplings, the g, the g prime, and the v also have uh, random values in in flavor space. So the usual Yukawa coupling has only randomness in flavor space. Uh, and that doesn't give you any resistivity at all. So this term would give you a perfect metal. Uh, but the, the, the flavor resistivity here is also a random function of R. So the correlator of this has a delta function of R. Uh, and similarly, V is the usual thing that we're familiar with. Uh, anyway, you take this theory um, and you uh, average over uh, all the couplings uh, average over this disorder uh, and take the larger limit. In fact, when you average over disorder, you get, let me write down for you, the universal theory. It's a path integral of a bilocal Green's function uh, with a bilocal action. And here it is. The coupling constants are G squared, V squared, and G prime squared. Uh, and there's some dispersion, which you can take any form you want. Uh, and really, this is the theory you have to now work out. Uh, at the moment, we've only worked it out in the large end limit. All the results I've showed you came from the large end saddle point or its response to external perturbations. In particular, for the transport, this generates you know something very familiar. People knew these are the right diagrams to look at, the Marky Thompson and the Aslamas of Largan diagrams. Uh, and so in the end, really all we have done is evaluate those our diagrams a little more carefully than they were evaluated in the past. Uh, but in principle, one could also go beyond the large end limit by studying this, and I hopefully there'll be work on that in the near future. Uh, let me finally mention what did I mean by uh, an important ingredient of the whole transport calculation is the idea of drag. So what is the idea of drag? Well, usually when you do electron phonon scattering, you have something called Bloch's law uh, that gives you resistivity, say, in three dimension of t to the fifth. But Bloch's law is incorrect, as Parallels pointed out, uh, because it ignores the conservation total momentum. Uh, and the, uh, eventually, phonons give the momentum back to the electrons. So the resistivity in, at low temperatures uh, that is actually zero in the electron phonon system. But because no crystal is perfect, uh, Bloch's law works. And one of the reasons, perhaps, it took so long to figure all this out for the strange metal is that Bloch's law was really too successful. People forgot that, you know, what really was required uh, for it to work. So the point is that in a non-Fermi liquid, Bloch's uh, uh, procedure makes no sense because in a non-Fermi liquid, 
it's, it's not as if the fermions and bosons are separate excitations. They're both entangled with each other. They don't even exist, the fermions and the bosons. There's just a quantum critical soup and really should talk, well, the only thing we can talk about is the total momentum. Uh, and that's why we have to worry about drag and that this large end calculation does that automatically. Okay, so I think I'll stop right there. And these are the uh, the results. Uh, I guess I have a few more statements about what is SYK uh, and the universal theory of margin Fermi liquid. Again, I want to thank my three brilliant collaborators and also point you to this article in reviews of modern physics. Thanks very much. <laughs>